Good afternoon. I am Kelly Brown Douglas, Dean of the Episcopal Divinity School at Union Theological Seminary here in New York. Thank you for joining us in another of our series of Just Conversations, where we engage issues of racialized inequities intrinsic to our nation and our collective responsibility to create a more just future. This afternoon, I am so very pleased to have with us in conversation, Bishop elect for the Diocese of Chicago, the and I take personal privilege to saying has been a good colleague and friend of mine for years. And so thank you so much, Bishop elect Clark, for joining us this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. I'm really glad to be here. Well, I want to jump right in because we have a lot to cover in a short space of time. So Bishop elect, our church, the Episcopal Church is over 90% white. It has a history of being a church of wealthy slaveholders and it carries forth that legacy more than the church wants to admit we'll return to that. <laughs> yeah. But it wasn't until 1970 that we got the first Episcopal Black Diocesan in Bishop John Burgess. Yeah. Not until 1989 that we had a Black female bishop at all, Bishop Barbara Harrison, and not until 2017 that we had a bl Black female diocesan. And then of course we had this run of Black female bishops after that. And then we get this historic slate in Chicago of four people of color on the slate to be bishop in Chicago, of which you were one. What was it like to be a part of that historic slate? And what did it mean for you? Yeah. It was incredible. So this Episcopalian did a Pentecostal shout when I <laughs> saw it, you know, because it, as, as candidates, we know that we will be on the slate but we don't know who else will be on the slate. Mm. And so I found out when everyone else found out. Oh, you're kidding. No, I'm not. I know. I found out when everyone else found out. And so like everyone else, you know, I was poised to go and hit it because we knew when it was supposed to come out. And I, it was unbelievable. <laughs> it really was unbelievable. Um, and I was overjoyed. Honestly, it did not matter which of us right. were, would be elected. All of us were qualified That's right. and God would be glorified no matter what. Right. And, um, you know, I, I knew these folks, I, I felt a kindred spirit. And so it was a different kind. I mean, people think of an election, you know, they're your competitors. They were not my competitors. They're my sisters and brothers who were on that slate. And the fact that the Diocese of Chicago had the courage to do that was absolutely unbelievable and so encouraging. It, I'm telling you, the, the love affair with Chicago happened with the announcement of that slate. Yeah. <laughs> it really did. I was like, my goodness, these people are full of courage and, and, it, and it was just unbelievable. So, so I want to get to, uh, to to that in a minute, and and but you know, as as I looked at the slate, I too uh, with you was shocked and 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 like, wow, uh, what just happened? And and after the joy subsided, I said, well, you know, and what this also suggests, because you're right, all of the candidates were more than uh, qualified yes. uh, to to be bishop, and so it suggested to me. Uh, how much talent that we have overlooked, right? Uh, because of these issues of systemic racism, uh, sexism, et cetera, then when it comes together. And so uh, what does that, what did, does it suggest to you about our church? Was this a once in a uh, blue moon thing? Uh, was it everyone was overjoyed and oh, isn't that nice? And now we look good for a while. What do you think it suggests for our church? I think it suggests to our church that we are ready as a church to stop the same old narrative. I really think that that's what it is. I mean, it's interesting. We have always not to, not to, you know, toot our own horn, but 
you know, Kelly, you know, and I know that most of us, as we enter into the priesthood, come with about three or four degrees with us, right? Yeah. <laughs> and a boatload of experience, professional experience. And yet are underestimated or have been all along underestimated in terms of our leadership in the church. And so I think that this beckons a new new day of at least recognizing it's the it's the issue of being overlooked right right of the recognition that hey wait a minute these folks have talent you know we um we we bring something to the table that perhaps at such a time as this the church needs and the church is looking for and so i think it's more recognition of what already existed honestly right. and so i think that's a that's a turning point so let's hope. So that leads me to this then. You, you know, I, I'm thinking of Anna Julia Cooper, uh, 19th century uh, Black Episcopal uh, laywoman. And, and she said this in her book, uh, A Voice from the South. She said, when and where I enter, the whole race enters with me. Meaning, of course, she as a Black woman. So we're getting ready to have, we've got, now we're going to have six. Yeah. Six Black women. Mm -hmm. that are entering the house of bishops. Yes. This which has been a bastion of white patriarchy, straight white patriarchy, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. So one, who's entering with you as a black woman as you go? And what difference will that make on that floor of the house of bishops? And what difference should it make? So you gave the litany of the, the House of Bishops and our Black entrance into it. And I can't help but to say all those people you just mentioned are the ones who enter with me, right? I, I, can, I can remember, I remember being at a Union of Black Episcopalians uh, conference and I had responsibility for looking after Bishop Barbara Harris. Mm. And you know, nobody can look over and <laughs> look after That's Barbara right. Harris. <laughs> And so in some ways she was looking after me, right? Even though I was carrying her vestments and doing everything. But I had the, the opportunity to sit down with her. And you did, give, given the fact that you worked with her on her book and to listen for an evening of her tell the stories, right? To tell the stories. I'm very cognizant mm -hmm. that the baton was passed mm -hmm. and that she had to undergo and, and deal with things that I will not. So she opened the door, right? And so then we've had this charge of five coming after her, you know, and me being the sixth. But I mean, Bishop Burgess, I can only imagine what he um, faced. And I know a lot of people are writing about this now. Mm -hmm. And so some of it is knowing their stories, carrying their stories and creating this narrative because heaven knows, I know and I will have my own stories to tell afterwards, right? And I know I, I don't have the rose colored glasses on about what that means. It is, we are still a white church. We are still a white country. We, are, we deal with a society that will have issues with my very body being in that place, much less the authority. You know, the authority is a whole nother thing. Right. And so uh, understanding what, um, what has gone before and what I will inherit to some extent um, is, is, is weighs heavily on me and yet gives me the courage, the bravery to move forward, you know, but it is a different thing. I, I visited the cathedral last December, at, uh, St. James Cathedral, and I saw the portraits of all, yes. <laughs> all, all the portraits. And I said, oh, my it, goodness, there is a new sheriff in town. Yeah. Because it because it, they I have like nothing in common with these my these oh. uh, predecessors. It's and, it's like Kamala Harris, right? Yes. Uh Vice President Kamala Harris and all of the portraits of the uh white male VPs. Exactly. And then you get uh, this woman of color that's Kamala Harris. So here's the thing uh, that I want to ask you. Uh, so really, you know, how do we move beyond 
it's simply being representation, yeah. right? And, and so that it makes a difference so that, you know, after, you know, we know that Bishop Harris paved the way in so many respects. And, and then we know, I think of the uh, spirit of, of Pauli Murray, who didn't Absolutely. get to be there and probably should have been there and the right. battles that she had to face and her intersecting realities of who she was. So how how does it become it's great it'll go down in history we've got six black women in the house of bishops at once but so what i mean history is going to say so what if it doesn't make a difference how what what difference do you hope to be able to make and and that it should make to this church so it's not simply representation so i think that i pray that <laughs> and i i have confidence that the holy spirit calls those for whom God has purpose, right? It is unique to their, their gifts, their charisms that God has provided for that time, for such a time as this, right? Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I don't think that it was a happenstance <laughs> that the, the background that I have, the things that I'm passionate about, about justice, about good stewardship of, of God's resources and other things like that about connections and relationship. I think that I was called to Chicago as a result of those things. Likewise, you know, I the, the other five black women in the House of Bishops, I've known for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> and I can say that a lot of what called them there had everything to do with who they were and what what gifts, what, um, what the people of those dioceses need, needed at the time they were called and, and that sort of thing. And I, and I feel very strongly that we have to bring ourselves, our, our, the integrity of who we are to these positions or else it is for naught, right? Yep. <laughs> It's not, it's not my job to just carry the light that pre that uh, preceded me, right? Or else we might as well just have had another one of those guys exactly on right. there. And so, so the the unique charisms that God has has provided for us have to be authentically expressed and carried out in order for God's will to be done. Right. And for us to live into to um, you know that our lights so shine that we can we can have an impact. And so I think, I think it has everything to do, you know, I talked earlier about the gifts that we were given. Well, we better use them, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and by virtue of who we are, that will impact the house of bishops and I dare say the church, if we are, are brave enough to express those. Well, I know all each of you, and I think you're brave enough and courageous enough. And we just had uh, our students had a conversation with Dr. Catherine Meeks, and yeah. she was speaking, and we know Dr. Meeks, and she was speaking to this and as well, and said, you know, just to one resist the church trying to make you into another one of those white guys, That's right? right. That's and right. and and you resist that, and together you resist that, and then we can we can change. Uh, what the legacy of who we have been as uh, a church of wealthy slaveholders, which I want to turn it a, a little bit and fully uh, understanding that you aren't in the diocese of Chicago yet, so you've got much to learn. So uh, not necessarily relating particularly to the diocese of Chicago, but the challenges of the church. We're now in the middle of uh, a pandemic. Yeah. Uh, and th the COVID uh, health pandemic has laid bare the inequities, particular racial inequities in this nation, laying bare, I should say, for folks who've been privileged enough not to suffer from them. Uh, uh, and I think, though, as we have talked about that, what we haven't talked about are the ways in which it is laid bare, the ways in which we have failed to be church. Yeah. for all of these inequities have happened on our watch. And perhaps I must admit most disappointing for me is that some of the most fervent conversations and animated conversations that have gone on in our church since the pandemic has been around what to do about communion and liturgy and, yeah. 
and the sacrament, etc. What have been your disappointments, perhaps in the way in which the church has responded uh, to this moment of converging, if you will, pandemics? And what are the lessons that you hope the church walks away with? So all of it has not been disappointment. I mean, certainly I had hoped, I would have hoped that the church would have been more vocal um, historically, even before the pandemic. See, that's why I think that's the problem, right? That's, what, that's right. Had we, had we talked more about inequity and justice issues, and how they are disproportionately affecting people of color, then we wouldn't have been behind the eight ball when everything, right. you know? I mean, so when when Ahmaud Arbery happened, that Arbery happened and Breonna Taylor, and then my goodness, um, the whole notion of, of COVID smacked us in the face, I would say, because, right. you know, in the Diocese of Washington, our first case in Washington, D.C. was an Episcopal priest, right? right? Right, But we didn't- Which got it from a very elite conference. I mean, let's- came from a very elite conference and all of these very elite people got COVID as a result of that. Right. And yet- That's right. And yet- and the yet, that's the yet. <laughs> and yet, you know, in the Diocese of Washington- That's right. We suffered- those parishes that were in Prince George's County That's right. and who had disproportionate numbers of Blacks or That's Black right. churches. I mean, I, I, I have to tell this. I think I, I've told you this before, but I'll share it with everyone who's listening. One of my most heartbreaking uh, uh, meetings that I had was with a parish that had that is almost entirely Black. I think they have one or two white uh, parishioners. And when I got on the phone call, the senior warden's sister was like number seven or eight who died of COVID. And the, and the um, junior warden had just gotten out of the hospital. And although on that particular call, the um, treasurer did not had get COVID not long afterwards he was hospitalized with COVID. And 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 I just use that particular church as a microcosm of what it means to be black That's right. in our church. That's right. Yeah. And so I, I I dare say no other parish had such an impact besides our Spanish speaking parishes that had okay. uh, had disproportionate numbers. And we were slow on the uptake. I'm I'm okay. just you know we were slow on the uptake. We did, to Bishop Marianne's credit, establish a COVID relief fund specifically to address those issues for people, individuals, families, and our feeding programs to be addressed. But I cannot tell you how heartbreaking those cases were. And we didn't have to help people once because they weren't going to get reemployed, you know? That's right. That's right. <laughs> you know, I mean, we had one case. And, and it was in the post, but we, we, we dealt with it first, of a woman who had COVID, had gave birth to twins in the hospital, and then went on the ventilator. Yep. yep. And then, yep. you know, she left two other children at home, you know, and, and the husband was unemployed. What do you do in circumstances like that? But, but, but all of these things, let us say that all of this, when we talk about pre-existing conditions, they were pre pre yeah, the pre-existing condition has nothing to do with your health status. It has everything to do with the with the socioeconomic uh, right. economic status and racial bias that you've been facing all along. Those are the comorbidities. Yeah, those <laughs> are the comorbidities. Comor exactly. Right. And we weren't we weren't capturing it that way. That's right. So we you're like saying that. That's right. 
So here's my thing. And yes, <laughs> to all that you're saying, and, and really, we've got to be honest here that some of the inequities that we see in society are in our church, as you've just illu illustrated. So and, and, and I'll move on from this in a minute, but what now we find ourselves, these very people that you're talking about, mm -hmm. and PG County, for those who don't know, is a majority Black county in this uh, Washington, D.C. area. The very people who are suffering most from COVID and have been most impacted are the people who have the least access to the vaccine. Absolutely. And I am so tired of hearing uh, white people uh, who are younger than me say, oh, I just got my second shot. What? Uh, duh, and, and going into areas getting these shots. What? should the church's responsibility be not simply and uh, well now in trying to make sure that these underserved parishes and communities get access to the vaccine and it's not just that people are scared it's people don't have access they don't have access i'm so glad you brought that up <laughs> um because i um i have you know, I'm a, a resident of Prince George's County. I might add one other caveat on Prince George's County. It's the most it's bl uh, affluent black county, right, in the country. Yes. So these are the so this whole notion that black people are scared to get the vaccine exactly is nonsense. Exactly, Let's just lay that right out there. It's nonsense, and it's access. And I um I I have I so in terms of the church. We have a lot of power in the church. I, I'm yes. just going to say the Episcopal Church yes. reeks with power, yes. right? That's and, the legacy and, of being wealthy slave owners. Yeah, I mean, so the, so the seat. I mean, I, you know, I have I have served not just in I served in a multicultural parish, but I also served in the diocese of Washington, a very fluent parish, right? Where you see the who's who of Washington sitting in the in, in yep. the pews. So I know the power that sits within the Episcopal Church well, and I and I'm even if if they cannot make it happen, they can help it happen. Right? <laughs> you know they 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 have they have the ability. I'm gonna just another quick anecdote, but it matters. So I so this morning I was seeking out because clergy we are one C we're category one C, but clergy in Maryland have the ability to get the vaccine and. And the grapevine in Prince George's County said, if you go here, then they can schedule you for a thing because they have extra vaccines. I mean, unfortunately, we've gotten to the place because, because access is so bad that the grapevine is more efficient than the processes that they, they put in it. So I drove over to a place this morning to see if I could get that because the grapevine knew that this place had extra vaccines. And by the time I got there, they had like 10 left and a whole lot of people in line and the woman there said this she said i grew up in this neighborhood mm -hmm. and i know that we want to get this vaccine so i've been on the phone trying to broker more vaccine That's to come right. to this place because my people she said my people my exactly. people have not had access to the vaccine exactly. and line exactly. up. so my thing is if we episcopalians saw us as our people, my people, we That's can make right. this happen. And, it's, and so it's not just, we are so fast to, to put everything in the lap of clergy. And clergy do have power, but clergy aren't the only people with power. The That's laity right. have incredible power in the diet, right. I mean, in the Episcopal Church. And we need to start tapping into and encouraging and exhorting folks to use the power that they hold. I mean, we hold a lot of power to the good of the, of the people, right? And That's so, right. you know, I, I mean, with, with our COVID relief fund, for instance, um, it became personal, right? Mm -hmm. Once they learned that there are people in the Diocese of Washington sitting in our pew, <laughs> you know, who are suffering mightily, it became their problem. And I'm not saying that, um, I, it's not an indictment, but we, but we are very, very quick to think individualistically, right? That's right. And so if the church can think of those who are their brothers and sisters within the Episcopal church 
then I dare say that it wouldn't take much for us to go that extra, go, go into that next circle and see the people of God, period, as our people, as my people. Well, you know, we, Episcopal Church claims to take very seriously the incarnation. And if we take that seriously, then we know that the incarnation means that justice always begins with those people who have had the least experience of justice, those people right. who have been on the raw underside of, of injustice. So, so you're right. And I'm so glad, uh, Bishop Elect, that you said that it is not about this myth. Uh, yes, there is a history of fear, but they are using that as an excuse yeah. for why communities of color have not had access uh, to this vaccine. And it's not an indictment. It's about the church growing into, to call ourselves church is aspirational, and it will remain <laughs> aspirational until we act like it in circumstances like these. Let me, our time is so quick. So I want to Two other real quick uh, questions for before we give a closing question. One, so what, as we talk about your expect expectations for the church, what what uh, do you hope for seminaries and seminarians uh, as they uh, train for the ministry? Oh, it's so interesting. I mean, I'm only, let's see how many years. I'm about 20 years out of a seminary myself now, right? Oh my goodness. <laughs> I'm, I'm only like 20 years. This age me, like me. It feels light years away, right? Um, you know, I, I was in seminary during 9-11. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember, I went to Virginia Seminary so I could smell the Pentagon, right? You could smell the Pentagon. And you talk about incarnational. The fact of what happened then affected me. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about this, I think we are at a Kairos moment again. That's right bigger than 9-11, where, where we better wake up or shut up, <laughs> you know? I mean, that's really where I am in that's terms right. of seminaries and seminarians. I mean, we, I, I can remember the, the conversations that were had where, where justice was a footnote, right? <laughs> I, I don't think we have that luxury any longer. I really don't. I think if, if we're preparing the people who will be leading our church of the future, it has to be, justice has to be front and center. Well, it's the gospel, like we- It is the gospel. It's not the add-on, it's the gospel. No, it is the gospel, it's central to the gospel. That's right. And, 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 and you know, that was a failure of my seminary training, honestly. Um, and, and I would hope and pray that going forward, it is, it, is, it is central to the formation of the people of God who are expected to lead the people of God. Well, that's why we have these just conversations yes, and, yeah. and people, people yeah. like you, because I, because that's right. It is. And that's, that's, if our church is going to grow into being church, uh, then it has to remember Dr. Catherine Meek says, just read about Jesus yeah. and, and you'll figure out that this, this is the easy work compared to what Jesus is calling us to. This is uh, social justice is the gospel. So it leads me, we've got two minutes. And so I'm going to uh, ask you, oh my goodness, I oh, so much more. So we're going to have to have you back once you have uh, been bishop for a while, then we'll, we'll have you back. But uh, uh, I want to ask you this sort of two in one. We, uh, that is what I often say, and as we've just said, that to call ourselves church is aspirational. And it's a challenge to grow into what it means to be church. Mm -hmm. And so what would it look like to be church? And I'll ask two at once and then you can, and if you closed your eyes and envisioned a just society, mm -hmm. what would that look like? So it would it would go to the great commandment, <laughs> love God, love your neighbor, and 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 it seems so simple, but the church has not figured out what it means to love its neighbor, you know, to love our neighbors. We haven't figured that out. We haven't even figured uh, out who our neighbor is. <laughs> yeah, we don't know who our neighbor is, and dare I say, sometimes we didn't care who our neighbor is, right? And, and, and so that selfless love, that agape love yes. 
the, the, the self-sacrificing love mm -hmm. is what the church would look like for me and, and, and yep. what the society would look like. And that is really aspirational, I know, but I, I, but that's what gives me the hope of getting up in the morning, you know? If I didn't that's believe right. that we could, if we could sacrifice, I mean, you know, how can we follow the one who, who got on the cross for us if we can't sacrifice? <laughs> that's right. So that being the case, I mean, I, and that's what it is. It's really about the agape. We don't talk enough to me about what self-sacrificing love. Right, right, right. And if we could get to that, you know, and everything that we just talked about really could be wrapped up in that, right? That's right. That's you know? Right. Yeah. I mean, we, right. would, we would not have inequities. That's right. We, we'd be on our way to be, we'd be on the ark to be a church. Yeah. Uh, we are at the end. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> and we promised you your time. Uh, and so we're going to stay faithful to it, but I'm going to hold you to coming back when you've been there. And I'm going to say, so what's, what's it like? But, you know, if we continue to be wise enough as a church to elect persons like yourself to the leadership of our church, then we'll get just a little bit closer to what it means to being church. I want to thank you, not simply for your time today, Bishop-elect Clark, but for your witness and your faithfulness to that agape love that you have called us to. And so thank you for being with us and we will keep you in our prayers and watch eagerly with the disruption that you were getting ready to create yeah. to bring us a little bit closer to being church and to being a just society. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I look forward to coming back and I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much. Great.